Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. A Bible study somewhat different than what you may have been exposed to in that it is expositional Bible study. Now, what is that? Mm -hmm. Generally, the preaching of the word that you've been exposed to from the pulpit is topical Bible Bible study. Topical Bible study is where we expect the minister to come with an inspired message that the Holy Spirit's laid on his heart. And that's necessary and needful. Uh, but no matter how inspired a message is by your pastor last Sunday, he may be a very anointed man of God. But let me ask you a question. Does the inspiration of the Holy Spirit leading him to preach on a particular message or topic does it equal the inspiration of Scripture? I think most people would say no. But the way the Scripture is arranged, how God presented this narrative to us in the first place, it is inspired. It is a collection of Scriptures that we break up into chapters, verses, and books in a divinely inspired arrangement that God designed to communicate a narrative to us that will put us over in life. But if you don't ever give yourself over to expositional, verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter, book-by-book study of the Bible, you are, pro you are denying yourself what may be the most potent um, demonstration of the inspiration of the inspired Word of God in your life. That's why Paul told Timothy and Titus, he said, give attention to reading. Isn't that interesting that evangelical churches, move of God churches, we feel like we've just, if we're on the cutting edge of anything God might be wanting to do, but you have to go to a liturgical church to have the reading of the word of God. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we're enriched for having redacted the reading of the word of God from our church life. Lord knows we make room for everything else now, don't we? Man, we will have an hour, hour and a half long worship service. We don't forget to take up the offering. Uh, we have done away with testimony and prayer requests for the most part, unless you're in a very parochial small church setting. Uh, we certainly have topical messages, not too long, 30 minutes. Sa snappy sermons serve faster you're, in 30 minutes or your tithe back, one church sign read, oh, <laughs> a real no. church sign. <laughs> But uh, to have the reading of the Word of God somehow, we have just decided that that's just liturgical, that's nominal, we don't need that, even though the Scripture says otherwise. So today we're studying, we've come, uh, after going through the Scripture, beginning in Genesis, all the way down today to Ephesians chapter 4. Saved, sealed, and equipped. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul articulates for us the reality that every one of us is called of God. I uh, say, so, well, I don't have a call of God in my life. Well, let's see what God's Word says about it. We tend to think of the call of God as being upon a clergyman, someone who's in the clergy, a professional minister, a religious leader. In Paul's view, ministry is not something done by religious professionals, but by believers. It is our, and that's a truth that was recovered during the charismatic movement when body ministry came to the forefront. Body ministry in the charismatic movement was the third rail that brought the glory, like the third rail, the electrified rail of a subway train. Um, the other two were worship and then the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, but we have uninstalled body, body ministry primarily because of insecure leaders. Mm -hmm. Insecure leaders, uh, ministers who like to hear the sound of their voice more than they like to hear the sound of God speaking through the gifts of the Spirit in the congregation. Uh, Paul considered ministry to be something not just for religious professionals, but for believers. It is our privilege and our joy 
to be chosen by God to manifest his love and grace one to another as believers and, of course, to the world around us in response to removing the contaminating influences of fallen culture because we are committed to fulfilling our ministry of demonstrating the grace of God to those around us, particularly of the household of faith. In response to that, the promise is that the Holy Spirit will hermetically seal us Mm -hmm. within and without from every blessing robbing influence in our life. You ever felt robbed of a blessing? There are influences that rob you of God's blessing. Paul addresses Mm -hmm. those in this chapter. So let's begin by reading Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 16 to begin with. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. He gave and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where we want to go. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So Ephesians 3 closes out with the declaration of the church as an instrument by which the glory of God will be disclosed in the earth throughout the ages, world without end. You know, what is the vehicle by which the glory of God will be made manifest or demonstrated? What is the vehicle through which God performs his will? Uh, Is it the political realm? Is it, what is it? How is it God's going to bring about his will? He said it's by the church. Uh, Sadly, the vast preponderance of believers today have given up on the church. But the church, Paul declares in chapter 3, is the instrument by which the glory of God will be disclosed throughout all ages, world without end. And for this reason, Paul says, uh, I beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Now, in context, what is the vocation that you're called to? It's the calling of the believer to be an active part of the church he describes in the previous chapter. Say, well, yes, my calling my calling is to make quilts. <laughs> or my calling is... No, he, he not only tells you to make, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, in the previous chapter, he tells you what your calling is. Right. Is to be a part of that church that he describes in chapter 3. The call of God is not just something that applies to those who choose a career as clergymen or full-time ministers. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with being a full-time ministry. But every believer is called of God and has a calling. You have a calling that you're accountable for. There are many functions and activities that we leave to the professionals that are actually our responsibility as believers. It is not safe, neither is it scriptural, to look to religious leaders to fulfill the functions of ministry that God holds you accountable or responsible to 
particularly where your family is concerned and also where the needs of others around you are concerned. You see somebody in need, oh, I wish the pastor would go over and pray with them. Mm -hmm. You see somebody needs groceries, oh, I'm going to call the grocery person in charge of the grocery bank and they'll go take some dented cans of vegetables over to that person. Oh, no, it's your responsibility. You cannot consign the things that traditionally in Christian culture we consign to the responsibility. That's what I pay my pastor for. No, it's our job as believers. And Paul makes this case abundantly clear. So the you have a calling and you have a testimony before God that must be pursued. Make your calling and election sure, Paul uh, commands us. Not, not rec he's not recommending, he's commanding. The question to ask is this, what are you doing with the salvation that God has so graciously made available to you? Amen. Kitty had a family member one time. She asked him, I said, are you ever going to do anything different with your salvation than what you're doing right now? He says, no, I think I'll just coast till the rapture happens. Now, you know, at least he said it. You know, he was being brutally honest. Most people think that way, whether they'd ever admit it or not. Uh, Jesus went to the cross. Now, let me say something to you. Jesus went to the cross to make it possible for you to do something more than sit in church on Sunday and look at the back of someone's head. It takes no grace from God to do that. Mm -hmm. Jesus did not go to the cross to put a church with a steeple on every street corner. We've had that for many centuries, and the world is unchanged. I submit to you that Jesus did not die to create the, creation, the Christian religious system as we know it. God could die, and most churches in the Christian religious system would just bang the tambourine a little louder. So in the context of his remarks... Paul calls the Ephesians. Now notice what he says. Walk worthy of the vocation. That's right. I'm going to get up and point my finger. And I'm going to tell. No. Notice what it says. With all lowliness. When's the last time you saw somebody get on a platform? We're, we're up on the platform when Paul says, if you're filling your call, you're walking in lowliness. You can't be on a platform and be lowly at the same time. Are you listening? With all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering. When's the last time you saw one of these strutting little Napoleons take the anointing of God and pervert it into some sort of narcissistic one-man show? Forbearing one another. How many times do we give pastors standing ovations? I'm not going to put up with that. We're not going to put up with that in this church. Yes, amen, pastor. Well, where's the long-suffering forbearing one another. You know what forbearing means for one another? That means, Luella, I'm going to put up with you and you're going to put up with me. Amen. Nanette, you're going to put up with me and I'm going to put up with you. Amen. Darcy, you're going to put up with me and I'm going to put up with you. Forbearing one another. Now you might roll your eyes and say, yeah, there he goes again, but I'm going to love him anyway. Mm -hmm. Are you Are you listening? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, Paul is calling us to tolerance and patience with one another in the interest of what? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace speaks to the solidarity of the church, not just in a particular group, but in an entire city. Remember, are we even capable of this kind of naked truth? Remember that in Paul's day, there was no such thing as many churches in one town. Paul would not recognize, he would not be able to recognize church as we know it as being connected with the Christ that spoke to him on the road to Damascus. Right. To Paul, there was one church in a city, and to have it otherwise was unthinkable. Paul declares, he goes on, he says, there's one body. Not many bodies of believers as, as it is today. There is one spirit, one calling incumbent upon all believers. The thought of recovering this level of solidarity in Christ is unimaginable today 
in its difficulty and for the preponderance of most Christians, not even desirable, to our shame. While we're called into the unity of the faith that is non-existent today, the only way we can say we have unity of the faith is if we're drawing the boundaries much smaller than God does. Paul goes on, in other words, we've moved the bar. Paul goes on to declare that every member of the body of Christ is bestowed grace. And to every one of us, verse 7, is bestowed grace according to what, what level of grace? Yes, grace that we're just going to, we're going to make it through till Jesus comes. Mm -hmm. No, grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In other words, a grace so functioning in your life, Nanette, so functioning in your life, Darcy, so functioning in your life, my listeners, that it literally, the grace in you expresses the magnitude of the charis of the grace that was upon Jesus when he walked the earth. Amen. Think about it. What does that mean, to have that kind of grace? That means you're saved for a purpose. God has a plan and a calling upon your life. And it's more than to be a passive participant in the programs of the local church. Right. This calling, in Paul's view, is central to the heart of God and the mission of Christ in his resurrection. Because he's describing this. We have a calling. Let's get along. Let's forbear. We're called to forbear one another. What kind of magnitude of power is available to help us do that? The magnitude of power that was expressed that brought Jesus out of the grave. He that ascended, what is it that he also descended? He that descended is the same that ascended, that he might fill all things. Fill all things with what? With, as an expression of the solidarity of the faith in the earth. And to the degree that we are disparate in our religious culture is an expression by which he does not fill us. And in order to bring this about, to bring about the activation of your calling, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, etc. See, if we're going to be a part of the unfolding of the purpose of God, then we're going to have to get some equipment. It doesn't take any equipment to sit in a pew. Are you listening? It takes no training whatsoever to sit in a pew or to post on Facebook. God has a vocation. He has a calling upon your life that verse 11 and 12 says is the basis as to why he gave the gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And people say, well, and the fact of the matter is we recognize teachers I'm sorry, we recognize pastors primarily and evangelists only vestigially. We don't recognize apostles in Christian culture today. We don't recognize prophets in Christian culture today. Teachers, that's somebody who runs the, the, the children's church or works in the Sunday school. We don't recognize these kids. Oh, we don't want to be title conscious. Then you're more spiritual than God because he gave titles to these ministries. Mm -hmm. Say, well, we've outgrown the, have we now? He said he gave these till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're not there yet. Until we have unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, till we've come to a perfect man to the, by measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, then we still need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Amen. And so, yes, I believe that. Who's the apostle in your life? Who's the prophet in your life? If you cannot instantly answer that by somebody who's speaking formatively in your life, that he's sacrificing to be in your life and you're sacrificing to be in his or her life, then you don't have one. Amen. Oh, Kim Clement's my prophet. Can I tell you, my brother and sister, Kim Clement is dead. William Branham is my prophet. William Branham is dead. How convenient for you. 
We need to begin to rethink these things. And if you agree with these things, then how come you're not out there telling 10 people? Oh, no, my church doesn't, you know, receive those things. Then you're in an apostate church. If you are in a church that does not accept the apostles, that does not accept the prophets, does not accept that we're they're needed until we come to the unity of the faith, then they have abandoned what is described in verse 13. And I don't care how sweet they are. I don't care how anointed they are. I don't care how... how uh, urgent they are and how um, honest they may seem to be. They have apostated themselves from the truth. And why are you going there? So true. Because they say, well, I don't answer you. Well, you're going to answer one day for why you chose solidarity with the group that excised from their canon what this chapter is talking about. Mm-hmm. We need to think about that. So when we read verse 11 about these gifts, we can identify these callings as we tend to identify them as the five vocational callings of clergy in the earth. We say, yes, those are our ministers. The thing to point out is, in Paul's view, they are not there to be ministers for us, but they are there, verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. They're not there to be your ministers. They are there to perfect or train you for the work of the ministry you think you pay your pastor for. It's your job. All of those things the pastor does, and of course, the pastor says, all contrary, you know, because he wants to do those things, because he wants you dependent upon him, because that's job security. But this is... According to, we're either going to believe the scripture, we're going to believe our church charter. Mm -hmm. Listen to what he says. He gave these ministries, verse 11, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. What do you do with that? For the edifying of the body of Christ. It's your job to do what we have traditionally consigned to. Oh, we don't want to let that happen. That's chaos. That's open pulpit. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, well... We're either going to have it our way or God's way. We're going to have to make up our mind about these things. So my question for you as a believer is, what ministry has your pastor equipped you for in the earth? As a pastor or leader, I ask the question, what ministries have you equipped the people for that you minister to each week? What, you equip them to sit in the pew? Most ministers don't look past the monumental effort merely to get people to show up on Sunday. These aren't churches, they're sheep sheds. The call of God on the leader's life and on the people is to do much, much more than this. The fivefold ministry exists not to be ministers for you, but to equip you for ministry with the end goal in mind, verse 13, that we all come into unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the full measure of the stature of Christ. What a lofty purpose. Mm-hmm. See, this is the standard by which we measure our validity and maturity. Are you mature? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm deep in the things of God. Well, here's the measure. Yes, we have a strong church. Do we now? then it's this church described in Ephesians. That's right. What about defining it as that in the breadth and scope of your community? Oh, no, we don't have anything to do with that church over there. What's wrong with that picture? Paul saw one church in one city. Oh, that's not how it is today. Why not? And what are we going to commit to? What are we going to embrace? Status quo? Is status quo determining what's valid today? Are we being authenticated by the status quo or by by being in pursuit of what God says? Well, I can't make it happen, but you can be a testament to what God wants. Amen. Amen. Are you listening? See, that's the standard. No less than that of Christ himself who said, The works that I do shall you do in greater works than these because I go to the Father. Read verse 17 through the end of the chapter, please. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not, as the other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. So if you're not thinking like he's saying here, you're no different from a Gentile walking in the vanity of your mind. You're just going to the church of your choice. Yeah, that's what the Gentiles did. 
walking in the vanity of their minds. No difference. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, um, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard of him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amen. So, when the fivefold ministry is not in evidence in our life, Paul contends, verse 17, that we're no different than the Gentiles walking in the vanity of your own minds, pursuing selfish goals without higher purpose being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance brought on by the fact that our leaders are not doing their jobs. And if they did, we would fire them because we don't go to church to be equipped for ministry. We've been taught to go to church to be ministered to and a little beyond that. And Paul laments this, that believers fall into without proper leadership. And he says in verse 20, he says, you haven't so learned Christ. Mm -hmm. And again, what is Christ? It's the anointing. You show me one believer who's anointed to sit in the pew and look at the back of somebody else's head. If we have heard Christ, verse 21, if we've been taught by him, we're putting off the former conversation, that means behavior, and we're being renewed in the spirit of our mind. This goes back to chapter 2 where Paul talks about the spirit that works in the children to disobedience in contrast to the spirit of Christ that works in the heart of the believer. If you are going to be under the influence of one spirit or the other, there is no neutral position where we may simply opt out of both God or Satan's influence. Outside of Christ, man is incapable of defending himself from demonic infestation. That's right. Impossible. You think of somebody who hasn't confessed Jesus Christ as their Savior? Well, he's a good man. He's, he's infested by demons. Ephesians 2 says it plainly. If you're not in Christ, there is a spirit. You're spirit filled. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of what spirit is it? That is the contention of Paul in the book of Ephesians, particularly chapter 2. You need to hear that. You need to realize what you're dealing with. That's why Paul said, what fellowship hath Christ with Belial? How can you have communion at the table of demons? Are you listening? But being found in Christ, it's up to us in proper relationship to godly leaders to put on the new man, verse 24, which after God is created in righteousness, that word means entitlement, and true holiness. If this is our portion and our inheritance, what do we do differently than those around us? First of all, he gets very personal. <laughs> He says, what does that look like? Well, the first thing, I want you to quit lying to each other. <laughs> starters. Now he's talking to believers. Do believers lie? You bet they do. They lie so effectively that they don't even notice the fact, take notice of the fact that they're doing it. Put away all lying. One of the biggest challenges in the pulpit is not to lie. One of the biggest challenges of men and women who get up in the pulpit is not to lie. 
You've, we've all heard it, evangelistically speaking. It's mm-hmm. so easy to fall into that. Why? Because there's a lying spirit in Christianity. He's there every time the doors are open. He follows believers everywhere they go. And he anoints them to distort the truth because he knows he can alienate them from the life of God that is in them if they do. And so he gives the fivefold ministry to call you on your stuff. <laughs> now, did that really happen? Is that how it really happened? Mm-hmm. So he put away all lying, Paul says. Why? Because God's going to judge us. Notice what he says. No, put away all lying because we're members one of another. Do you see the the call for that level of intimacy with one another? Because we love each other so much. Let me tell you something. I've I've never lied to my wife. That's right. Never. Why? My motivation not to lie to my wife is not because I'm afraid of her. (laughs) She's a terrible woman. (laughs) Terrible (laughs) terrible as an army with banners. (laughs) But I don't lie to her because I love her. Are you listening? See, let your love provoke. Disclosure, transparency, and honesty with your brothers and sisters in Christ. He goes on to say, verse 26, be angry and sin not. Go ahead and get mad. Just don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Listen, we have people, we have generations of people in this country, in the United States and in Europe and other places in the world where generationally, People have been birthed in anger. They've been angry their whole life. They lay down in the grave in anger. And we have anger compounded upon anger until people are incapable of any other emotion. You have to learn how to deal with anger. Listen, popular culture and the media, they're there to make every effort to make you angry and chagrined about what's going on in the world. Turn on the news. They're there to make you angry. Why do they do this? Because when you're angry, you're manageable. My dad made a statement. He said, when you raise your voice in a situation, that's an indicator that you're not in control. Mm -hmm. The other person's in control. When you are angry, it turns you into a commodity that the news media can sell to their advertisers, all the while deceiving you into thinking their highest purpose is to keep you informed. All the news you need to know. (laughs) Because it's all the news they're going to use to make you angry. And then they take that anger, they quantify it in a chart, they show it to their advertisers, and they make merchandise of your anger. And then they wipe their mouth and say they didn't do anything wrong. They're just trying to keep the people informed. Are are you even capable of waking up to that fact? Politicians. Politicians are masterful manipulators. Now we don't judge a politician as to whether they lie or not. It's whether or not their lies benefit our agenda or not. And then that's the guy we're going to endorse. Politicians are masterful manipulators at keeping you mad so you won't hold them accountable for their actions. God says, be angry, but don't stay angry. Never let the sun go down on your wrath because when you do, verse 27, you give place to the devil. You give a barco lounger to the devil in your life when you go around in anger. That's right. You've given him an easy chair in your life. You've given him station in your life that is as ensconced in your life as the throne of God itself when you allow yourself to go around in angst and anger and frustration all the time. Paul also tells the Ephesians not to steal anymore, but to labor with their own hands so they can support the needy. So what were the Ephesian believers doing? They were stealing. Mm -hmm. Are you listening? They were not only lying, they were stealing. Stealing and lying was so much, and this was a very affluent city. They weren't stealing because they were broke. They were stealing as a way of life. They were stealing Think about it. Does government steal? You better believe they do. They call it taxes. 
<laughs> Are you listening? Mm -hmm. Do we steal? We steal every time we spend something on ourselves that we ought to be using to take care of the poor. We steal every time we take something and we sacrifice. It's amazing how we will borrow money. We will leverage ourselves to the hilt to meet our own needs and not sacrifice in like manner to invest in the purposes of the kingdom. I'm not suggesting you borrow money. I've had people come to me and want to do that, want to borrow money to give into the ministry. I won't let them. That's not what I'm saying. But we think nothing of stealing our future, stealing our children's future to meet our needs that we're not sacrificial toward the needs of others or somebody else's agenda other than our own. Stealing was and lying was so much a part of their culture that they had to be told to stop doing it because their conscience wasn't telling them. Their consciences were seared. These are believers. Their consciences were sealed, sealed, excuse me, seared due to the systemic corruption in their culture. I know people that they, they're God robbers. They're absolute God robbers. Oh, well, that's all under the law. Yes, if you're not in Christ, you're under the law. And if you are in Christ, you're doing more than what the law commands. So if you're not giving at least 10%, you've placed yourself under the law and under the curse of the law. Not because we're under the law, because when you give beyond that, you're out from under the law completely. Because Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to enter in to the enfranchisement and the entitlement that's in the new covenant. And I know people that do not understand. They weep tears because they don't understand why they struggle financially, but they're God robbers. They're breaking and entering uh, God's treasury every time they cash their check. And they think, well, I'm just, it's the best I can do. My heart goes out to them. It, it, it truly does. I, I don't judge you. Your your actions bring uh, recompense on you. I would love to see you come out of that into a place of benefit Amen. that's available. Amen. And we have all kinds of justifications as to why why that is. Stealing becomes a way of life. Lying becomes a way of life. And because of it, he said, we make room for Satan. Satan is securely ensconced in our lives because of such things. And again, he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the most spiritual church, literally the high watermark of Christian history throughout all time. There is no more spiritual church or congregation than the Ephesian church. And look what he had to tell them. Paul goes on to say, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths or on your Facebook profile. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. If it isn't good or edifying, and if it doesn't minister grace to the hearers, it should not be a topic of conversation. Now, most of us would say, as we've had ministers tell us, don't be so naive. We need to talk about what's going on in the world. I watch the news so I know how to pray. I'm an intercessor. I question that calling in your life. If you think you're going to listen to the lies of Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, and all those, and, and think that now you're praying about the lies by which you're being manipulated to become a commodity to sell to an advertiser, and you're taking that before God as your discernment? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when I stopped listening to the news, I started prophesying to nations. And when I began to prophesy to nations, I saw world leaders repent. Amen. World leaders repent about things I had no idea was going on in the natural because I didn't watch the news. Amen. If God wants you to know it, he'll tell you. John the Revelator was not watching Rome News Network to see what he was going to base the book of Revelation on. We think we need to talk about what's going on in the world. We make Facebook posts about all the horrible things taking place around the world so that we can be informed. We post pictures of aborted babies and all this foolishness. That's corrupt communication. What happened to whatsoever things are good, pure, perfect, lovely, and good report think on these things? Oh, we need to stand up. Yes, I know. You're going to be hangry. And by being angry, you're giving Satan a seat in your life. And you think you're standing up for righteousness and you have no clue. 
why you're defeated and why things don't change. What would Paul say? When we do such things for whatever purpose, verse 30 says, we are grieving not only ourselves and those around us. He says in verse 30, we're grieving the Holy Ghost whereby we're sealed to the day of redemption. Do you understand the implications of verse 30? The Holy Spirit seals you with an airtight seal of grace to keep the contamination of the world out of your lives that will rob you of your blessing. So I'm going to ask you, the Holy Spirit is the sealant. Are you a leaky Christian? It's like the guy was praying, Oh, God bless me. Oh, God bless me. And he broke into tongues. And in tongues he said, Don't do it, God. I'm a rebel. (laughs) If you lie, if you steal, if you entertain what Paul calls corrupt communication, then I submit to you, you have sprung a leak and you wonder where the blessing of God went. You've made a place for Satan himself in your life and you wonder why you are so opposed in your destiny. Brothers and sisters, if I could just reach out and take you by the hand right now, I'd do it. If I could just look you as my brother and as my sister, I would just like you to say, are you capable of taking a good hard look at your level of honesty the character of your behavior in hopes and in the interest of seeing restored in your life the quality of grace that the Holy Spirit intends to fill you with for your good and his glory. Why do we engage in corrupt communication? Verse 31, because he said, put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. Let that be put. I'm not talking evil. I'm just telling it like it is. And you're hemorrhaging the grace by which the Holy Spirit intended to seal you. Good word. See, we allow bitterness, wrath, anger, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice to flood our lives. Well, what do we do with all that? Paul says, put it away from you. Just let it go. <laughs> just, just let, <laughs> kidding. She tells me I get riled up sometimes and she'll just go. She waves her hand and she goes, just let it go, Russ. (laughs) Amen. Just let it go. Let these things be put away from you. What are the influences in your life that provoke anger, wrath, bitterness, etc.? You might be sitting down to dinner every night with your source of anger, wrath, and bitterness. Mm -hmm. Just let it go. Put these things away from you and replace them proactively by looking for opportunity. He says, rather than all this, he says, be kind one to another. My goodness, isn't there somebody? Well, ain't nobody being kind to me. That's why. Go find somebody to be kind to. Oh, they don't respect me in that church. I'm not talking about the people looking down their nose at you. I'm talking about the people everybody else is ignoring. Go find somebody. You could fill a room. You could fill a stadium with people that nobody wants anything to do with. Go find somebody to be kind to. To be forgiving and understanding and tenderhearted. Extending toward others who have offended us the same grace by which God has forgiven us. Are you prepared to do that? Who are you angry with? I love what Paul said in another place, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. God told me, pray about what makes you mad, pray about what makes you doubt. I always know how to pray. I instantly know how to pray. What am I mad about and what am I doubtful about? (laughs) And lifting up holy hands, what am I doing? I'm just letting it go. (laughs) Are you prepared to do that? Just, Just forgive them. They don't deserve it. You don't deserve your salvation. Just forgive for your own sake. For the sake of your testimony. You realize that's what the fivefold ministry is for? Here's the ground floor. We're, we're not going to get out in that magnitude of ministry with smoke machines, spotlights, and big crowds. Paul's view is if I can just get you to quit lying and stealing, <laughs> if I can quit get you away from clamor and anger, if I could bring you into unity, the fivefold, Jesus paused. He looked down on all this clamor and anger and disunity. He says, man, I'm going to have to give some fivefold ministry down there if I ever have hopes of them being anything other than an absolute mess. Mm-hmm. 
Because when we give ourselves over to those things that God desires to see produced in us, kindness, forgiveness, what happens is the seal gets restored. Once again, the Holy Spirit comes in to wall you off from all the contamination of the world that's robbing you of God's best in your life and in your situation. Holy Spirit, we come to you right now and we readily confess that there was a time in our innocency and our naivete that you came in and you sealed us with the hermetic seal of your favor. And we know what that looks like, but God, we leak. We've leaked through bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, disunity, opinion, so many things. And God, we've sat back and, and expected a professional clergy to come in here and tay-tay us with a sugar tit and make it feel all, so much better. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you begin to move upon your people to come into a place of maturity and a moment of clarity to embrace once again the work of the Holy Spirit in their life to produce the character of Jesus in all lowliness, meekness. God, restore our tender heartedness. Yes. The world might look at us and mock. Our brothers and sisters in Christ might look at us and mock. But God, help us to recover meekness and lowliness, yes. forbearance and tenderness one to another. Let us look with a single eye at my brother and at my sister today and embrace them as one in whom I'm not willing to go to heaven without, Father. That we could come into such a solidarity that we could say without hypocrisy, even to those that we're not getting along with, and say, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you because the love of Christ, which said the same thing to us, is flowing out of us in an anointing of compassion to embrace those for whom Christ died as our brothers and our sisters. Father God, would that be so possible to be locally manifest by this digital extension of the anointing that knows no boundaries and no distance to touch the lives of my listeners and to create, Father God, a solidarity of Christ that can be identified as that body through whom you said your wisdom would be made manifest throughout all ages, world without end. Could we be that, Father? Father. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.